On today's show, the Cavs season is done. Final. It's over. We'll talk about how it got there, what it means, the questions it raises on a new episode of Locked on Cavs for Thursday, April 27th. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. I'm Chris Manning covering the Cavs and the NBA for outlets like SB Nation, Cleveland Magazine, Forbes, and the Just Basketball Show. That man over there is Evan Damerill, the founder of the independent site, Ray Town Euclid. As always, we have Jake Stevens producing. Uh, Download the Game Time app today, by the way. Create an account. Use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Although you will have to wait until the fall to use that to buy Cavs tickets again. I want to thank you again for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. That includes YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I also want to remind you that next season, the Cavs games will be on Sirius XM. Catch every moment of the Cavs hometown broadcast with Sirius XM and the SXM app. Just search Cavs. Or if you want to listen to other NBA teams, Go do that because those teams are still playing basketball. I mean, Cavs lose game five, a very big continuation of the of the rest of this series. We'll talk about that in segment two because I think the big thing coming out of this game is I think this leads to questions with the Cuban Cavaliers. This was a four-seeded team that had a, one of the best net ratings in the league, that had one of the best defenses in the league, that had a first-team All-NBA guard. That got straight up punked in the first round against the New York Knicks. That was a bad style matchup. All that stuff that we talked about in our series previews and all year, I think was true. But they got straight up punked. They go out at home for much of the game. They kind of just felt like they were coasting, to be quite honest with you. This felt kind of like where this was headed. I I think this just, whether change comes or not, I don't think there's drastic change needed, but I I think this begs questions about what this team is and what they need to do to kind of get to where they have said they want to get to. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's going to be a lot of uncomfortable conversations going forward, whether it's uh, personnel decisions, whether it's coaching decisions, whether it's anything, really. Um, In the moment, it's disappointing for sure, especially just as you let this sink in and kind of hit you in waves. But just the fact, as you said... um, this Cavs team was one of the top teams in terms of net rating. They're the number one defensive team in terms of defensive rating. They're pretty high up there in offensive rating. They fluctuated between n- number one at times, and they didn't really fade out of the top ten at all. But as you had noted, the playoffs are just an entirely different beast compared to the regular season. And 51 wins don't mean a thing if you ain't got no ring or at least a serious playoff push or effort because I agree I think to start the game it just felt like the same recipe for failure uh, there was a lack of effort on Cleveland's part I mean shouts outs to the uh, the role players and Isaac Okoro and Karis Levert for remaining competitive all throughout this game or else it would have been a little bit wider of a margin of defeat for Cleveland at the end of the day but you, you could see Cleveland kind of putting out on a little bit in the fourth quarter but just in a vacuum, uh, this is incredibly disappointing just considering how talented this Cavs team was. And sure, as you had noted, the, this Knicks team stylistically is a tough matchup for the Cavs. I think personnel-wise, a tough matchup too, bench-wise especially. But the Cavs got their butts kicked. Um, there's a, a lot more questions than I think there are answers at this time. And it, it's going to be a lot of unpacking and just kind of watching and just feeling out the waters and everything on what the next steps are for this Cavs team. But for now, it's it's certainly frustrating. Um, you can think it back to like all the successful moves during the regular season. But again, the regular season success does not mean nearly as much uh, when you get your pants pulled down and spanked in the opening round against the Knicks. And no discredit to the Knicks. They're, one, they're a great team. But Cleveland didn't really seem to have much of a dog in the fight any, at any point in this series. I think there are the the questions that I would have. I think they 
start with what is it what does the roster look like going into next season how do you improve it i think that's what this all goes into now there are clearly deficiencies in this roster at this playoff series i think really exasperated the fact that this team needs help on the wing that this team's bench isn't very good that mm-hmm. like even the role guys you like if Karis silver is a pretty inconsistent player i'm an isaac O'Coral guy and i think he played pretty well in game five but like is that a guy that when teams don't respect him, can you fully trust him? You know, like, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, you got to pro- you got to improve on, on what Jetty Osmond is as you go forward. And what do, what do you do with Rubio and Wade and basically everyone that isn't your top four guys? And even if you want to look at maybe changing out the top four, it's like, okay, like, is Jared Allen our, our mechanism to, to do things? And how do you, what is, what is, what, is, what, what does this reflect on JB Bicker's staff? Like, I think there are lots of mm-hmm. questions. Some of them will just mean you run some of it back. This is a very young team. But I, I think it I think if they just run this back fully, I think considering you have Donovan Mitchell, considering you have Darius Garland, considering you're heading into year three of Evan Mobley, who, you know, didn't play well in the series, but I, I think has just a ton of two way potential and obviously I mm-hmm. all NBA potential. <laughs> like it would be a mistake to me to not look at this and be like, We can't let this happen again. I that that is where I think if you're them, this has to be that has to be where you go out of this. Is that that this kind of series loss Kit isn't acceptable for what the talent you have. Oh, a hundred percent. And that's what I meant by the uncomfortable conversations. I think if you're the Cavs, you have to stare long and hard in the mirror of, okay, can we run it back with this core four? And we'll just assume Karis the Vert and then Ricky Rubio, of course, since Rubio is on a contract, but Rubio could be a tradable piece too. But if you are Cleveland, um, you are, behind the eight ball a little bit here the pressure is on the clock is ticking is what i'm looking for more than anything um heading into next year the Cavs realistically only have a two-year window left with donovan mitchell on their roster because he could opt out of his player option heading into that third and final year of his contract and i would assume he would who knows what happens between now and then but either way like you have to make a lot of moves that show mitchell you're serious about winning now and in your point as well like the Cavs really do need to see like okay what can we legitimately upgrade on outside of our four guys in Levert because Rubio is not like a rock rock solid uh, option either and he, he, clearly there's he, there's, t- there's could, plenty of room for improvement he, there but he could he could play in the playoffs like couldn't do yeah. it and now that you have a little bit of this taste and understanding of what the postseason has in store for you and just how like it's different comparatively to the regular season in a lot of ways you really have to do this long stare and evaluate like okay do we want to keep rolling out this too big system do we don't really predicate three-point shooting we focus more on an interior attack and let like donovan mitchell and darius garland uh just do donovan mitchell and darius garland things on the perimeter or do we want to support and supplement that and just build around it and make ourselves a little bit more modern i think these are all valid questions and again like the Cavs are at a crossroads um and they are certainly asset limited as well so it's going to be curious to see what moves they make, but just in the scope of this game and how this series went, it's very disappointing. And as we go on, as this offseason evolves, Chris and I will do a full autopsy of this series, I'm sure, and we will give our final um, diagnosis and everything of just like everything that went wrong in between. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can say off the top, but the, the Cavs got worked. And um, it was in terms of physicality, and then like Darius Garland hit the nail on the head. Like, I think it was an experience, but the Cavs were super careless with the basketball sometimes too, and really shot themselves in the foot more often than not in this series. Just to end this segment, I think just to continue to look ahead, we'll talk about why this game was such a continuation of the series in, in segment two. Who's just get, I need a name, 10 seconds quick. Who is the person who you come out of the series most wondering about what happens with them next as we go into the offseason? Jared Allen. Uh, Jared Allen is who I wonder just because he was really beaten up by Mitchell Robinson um, in this series, and it really does make you question, okay, how tenable is it to play two seven-footers alongside each other? How about you? Tim or Bickerstaff. It's they're probably one A one B to me, and you could convince me either thing. Um, Allen is probably the more likely one, just because his contract is shorter, and it's like easier to like see what you could do with twenty million dollars than it would be to like mystery box the coaching situation. Even if I think JB did a pretty poor job in the series, uh, thoroughly just got out coached by Tibbs, and that's that 
was a big, big reason why they lost. All right. And, and, and the tricky thing is, is Tom Thibodeau isn't, he's a, he's a good defensive mind. He is a, has a lot of tactical advantages over JB, but Tom Thibodeau is not a strong playoff coach either. Well, yeah. Well, it's not like this was like Eric Spolster diced you up. This was it's correct. Tibbs in 2023. Like that's tough. Absolutely. Today's episode is brought to you by Pro Basketball GM. It's the coolest game I've played in a long time. I've always thought it could be a great NBA GM, and as it turns out, it's really not all that easy. If you've had the same thought and have fantasized about managing your own basketball franchise, go and download Ultimate Pro Basketball GM right now. The game allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise, playing through the seasons, leading your franchise and fans to glory as you build a historic dynasty you're, you're responsible for dealing with challenging personalities, hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and trading players, and making draft picks. You have to navigate your franchise through free agency in the draft as well. All of this is in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely in, in playable offline, playing the go as you want and when you want to. Lockdown Cavs listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game store. So just make sure to check it out to download the game. Just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code if you're watching on YouTube. It's right below Evan, and or look it up on the app stores. Again, that's probasketballgm.com. Pro Bas Pro Ultimate Basketball GM. Start your dynasty today. Today's episode is brought to you by Ibotta. We've always been throwing money at something. We're always just spending money. Kids' school supplies, a new house project, the list goes on. I'm moving right now. I'm spending so much money. It's time to stop spending your hard-earned money without getting anything in return. Enter Ibotta. You can always earn cash back on every shopping trip. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. Even you link your loyalty counter, upload your receipt after you shop and get your cash back. It is that easy. The average user earns $120 a year in real cash back. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, or you could use your cash back to buy that flight you've been eyeing, that game you've been dying to go to, or the fancy dinner you've been craving. A typical basket of groceries, for instance, costs over fifty dot was over fifty dollars more expensive at the end of twenty two at the end of twenty twenty two compared to the beginning of the year due to inflation. You could earn two and a half times that back in from Ibotta, or even more depending on how much you use the app. It gives you real cash back, not points. Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, you get real cash back that you can cash out to your, to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Right now, Ibotta is giving our listeners five dollars just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store. And again, use that code LOCKED. Thanks for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. Every dayers are going to be back on Friday with a further autopsy of where this Cavs season goes. And I think what we'll do is we're going to start asking the big questions. We kind of did that in segment one, but we're going to say, what is next for Jared Allen? What is next for Evan Mobley? Should J.B. Bickerstaff's job be safe? All of the questions I think that are rattling around Cavs fans' brands right now, we're going to talk about them. So, Evan, in looking at this game, Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you. So I, I had something I needed to do. So I was not covering this one as media. I watched it at home. Tell, t- set the scene. What was it? If tell me, tell tell me what the environment was like. Tell me what the energy in the arena felt like from from the opening tip and, and as the game went on. So I'll take you even further back. Uh, at shoot around this morning, or rather, at practice yesterday. Um, Jared Allen admitted that the Cavs were a little rattled in New York. Uh, Darius Garland, when he said that, said he's going to talk to Jared about it just jokingly. But you could kind of just tell it was a similar vibe as it's always been just throughout this entire postseason process that the Cavs were saying all the right things. They appeared to be all locked in and viewing the same objective, you know. And this is just from the Cleveland side of things. I didn't have a full scope of what. Tibbs or the, the, the Knicks or anybody were, was really saying. Um, but regardless, um, just heading into the game, like you could tell, like the Cavs weren't like joking around. Like, yeah, they're trying to be light and comical about things and maybe not like take it too seriously because like you don't want to be pressing too much. But like I said, they're saying all the right things and they keep saying all the right things. But in theory, that sounds great. But in execution, it just wasn't there. It was the same rapport 
four, game one, game three, game four. The Knicks just out physical, out hustled, out worked the Cavs every step of the way, and it was somewhat frustrating for the fans there. You heard the Boobers coming out in the first half, just when the Cavs were just struggling offensively, and the Knicks were kind of getting whatever they wanted, and you could you could tell um, that Cleveland was just again just not like fully ethereal is the way I want to put it and it was just a case of too little too late where the Cavs tried to put something together at the very end and it wasn't enough to kind of just get them over to the finish line and win this game and it's unfortunate that the the season ended this way that the Cavs um, at least like they said like we weren't gonna give up we're not gonna like lay down and just give up we're not gonna give up home court we're gonna defend home court blah 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 all that stuff and the Cavs did the exact opposite of what they said they were gonna do and I think that's the most disappointing part of it all is just like the Cavs it feels like they quit and it just feels like the Knicks again for the umpteenth time just hit them square in the jaw right away and the Cavs reeled from that physicality because they're just not quite comfortable with it and it's just again it's just it's disappointing so mitchell robinson just again ruined the Cavs in the offensive glass i think he you could make the argument he's the most important player for the knicks in that series and he's a good player i'm a big fan he had 11 offensive rebounds in this game that's more rebounds than either jared allen or evan mobley had in this game he just kicked their butts on both ends of the floor over and over and over again. The Knicks had another just gargantuan offensive rebounding night. The Knicks got out in transition. They had an, an offensive rating. This this is where I knew it was over. I did, I kind of didn't think the Cavs were going to win coming in, to be honest with you. Um, I We talked about this on the preview show. Like, I I couldn't believe the line was five and a half for Cleveland. Like that Neither did mind. I. And I thought like, okay, they'll go out swinging in this one and maybe they scrap away to find a win. And I'm like, they're not going to win in the garden on Friday. But yeah. Five and a half was a lot. And then the Knicks yeah. come out and post an offensive rating of 138.6 uh, in the first half. Mm-hmm. And the Cavs defense, which is, bit, which is like held up throughout the series. And like the, the end result was the Knicks offense that was like close to like league average, a little above league average offense for the game. Like two points better per possessions they got smoked in the first half and it's like, Oh, this is going a certain way. And then you factor in the offensive rebounding, the hustle plays like the shot selection. I think for Mitchell, just like everyone's kind of general energy. It it just, it's like, Oh, we're just going to do this. But with the Cavs, like energy level, like dialed down. And it was very much just every game, except game two, game two, like in retrospect, that was the game where I was like, Oh, okay. The Cavs figured some stuff out. There's energy going forward. That game was the anomaly. Everything else, including this game, was the same exact recipe, like almost over and over and over again. Yeah, and that's the frustrating thing is on a game to game basis, it feels like Cleveland didn't make a ton of adjustments. Like, sure, uh, JB Bickerstaff went with Danny Green and Isaac Okoro first off the bench in this game, which was su- surprising a little bit, but. Um, you then saw like Lamar Stevens getting some minutes as well, or like the fact that there were some minor tweaks and things, but it, it just felt like all throughout the series, Cleveland was grasping at straws and trying to find something that would work and something that would click. And it's, it's frustrating because I asked Jared Allen this uh, leading up to this game. I asked Darius Garland this leading up to this game, like, Hey, if there's just like that one thing you could capture from game two, um, and apply it to this next home game and just the remainder of the series, what would you do? And they said, oh, yeah, we played with a ton of physicality. We played with a ton of pace. We made our defense convert into offense. Um, obviously, a lot of things were clicking for us, but like we found ways to get out on transition and kind of beat New York at their own game. And you're like, okay, great, yeah, let's see you apply that. And then for me, when the Cavs announced the starting lineup and said Karis LeVert was still in the starting five, I was surprised by that just because... It felt like the Cavs are doing a lot of things that were counterintuitive to winning in this game and in this series, and the wheels were ready to fall off the wagon. It was rickety, and maybe there was a chance Cleveland could roll this back into New York for Game 6, but time and again, the Knicks just continue to play with a sense of urgency and a sense of presence like they were the team that was staring down the uh, barrel of elimination, whereas the Cavs were kind of going through the motions and, as Channing Fry said, treating this like a regular season game sometimes. 
the the physicality component of it was the thing that like and seeing the post game stuff come through was the thing that also just seems like it caught them off guard which seems weird to me like yeah like you thought you like I, like there weren't adjustments like tactically but you would have you would have thought maybe by like game five that it's like oh the physic we have to like ramp this up and so on. like just all of this just seems like very weird in how everything is kind of unfolded like the Knicks winning was never implausible but I think just this specific way feels very bizarre to me is that does that feel that way to you yeah it does just because it just feels so uncharacter characteristic of this Cavs team in general like sure there were frustrating losses this season there were moments when the Cavs were definitely out but there were at least more often than not you could say like okay at least they tried at least they gave their best effort at least they tried to apply everything they could and do everything from it and again i'm i'm not going to go into jb bickerstaff a lot in this one i have questions about his decision making and planning and things like that and we'll save that for another episode because we need to find five episodes a week somewhere since the calf season ended so soon but like Bickerstaff saying like, hey, this is a learning experience for the us or like this is something that we can learn from. And I think I understand the sentiment where you can't recreate the playoff intensity or playoff atmosphere. And I know the Cavs pumped in crowd noise at the practice facility leading up to this series just to kind of get the guys acclimated to at least the sound levels. And there's a lot of missteps and misfires from this that the Cavs did. Um, I question a lot of the logistics and optics behind it, but again um there are way more questions than there are answers at this time when it comes to cleveland and i'm very curious to see how they um adjust things uh going forward today's episode is brought to you by game time if you're buying tickets for your favorite event it should not be stressful game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports music and comedy theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hype for the fun you'll have they have flash deals and last minute tickets easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area and images of seed views i know when i go to new york in august i'm gonna use this i'm gonna use game time to buy tickets to aces liberty in Brooklyn, that's going to be awesome, and I'm going to get the best deal possible on game time. You can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, concerts, and many, many more. And you can forget you don't have to plan months in advance anymore. You can get right up to the day of the event and find the best deal. Plus, the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked in NBA all one word for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Locked in NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan and the all new all electric twenty twenty three. Nissan Aria. Um, Evan, we have to give out an elect- a Nissan most electric player of the worry. week. All right, who, you take it. Who, who's our player of the week? Uh, is right, it Moondog? Folks. No, it's not Moondog, even though he is a good boy. Um, we are digging deep, folks, because we are in off-season mode. And with the 49th pick in the 2023 NBA draft, the Cleveland Cavaliers should consider Nissan player of the week Terrence Shannon Jr., a guard slash wing player out of Illinois. Uh, Senior at Illinois this season, he averaged 19.3 points, 5.2 rebounds, 3.1 assists, 0.5 blocks, 1.4 steals. Has some shooting upside to him. Certainly has the size as well because he's 6'6 with a 6'8 wingspan. Kind of would make sense as like a development project for the Cavs. And folks, we're in offseason mode, so we're going to start shouting out college dudes that Chris and I have zero research or experience from. I just pulled this from a mock draft. Yeah, I read a lot of NBA Big Board. Shout out Raphael Barlow. Uh, the 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. So, Evan, I, let's end just talking about Donovan Mitchell because this was the Mitchell Bowl. And this was a very, I think, just a very poor series for Donovan Mitchell. This was not a particularly 
positive series for Mitchell. You know, I know I saw some of the quotes he had said he wasn't the guy that needed him to be. I, I found myself like watching him play, and you know, I find he has been electric all year. There's no doubt about how good he has been all year, and, and he's going to make first team All NBA or at least be on one of the All NBA teams, and deserves it for what he did in the regular season. I find him in these playoff situations without the plus creating without the shooting around him to really give him a ton of space. The Knicks had a great game plan on him. He he has to just come away now feeling very frustrated. And I wonder, like, he he is not the number one guy in my list of, like, what I want to see how they come back in the fall. That is Evan Mobley. Year three, Evan Mobley is going to be something I or will see what the leap looks like. But I'm really curious to see, like, where Mitchell goes from this. He came into this year so motivated from the get-go to prove a point. And then, but again, for the second year in a row, he has lost to Jalen Brunson in the first round of the playoffs. And this time it's against the team he thought he was getting a trade to. This is, I'm sure this is going to bother him. There's just no way it doesn't, knowing what we know about Mitchell. Yeah, I mean, it was clear it, it bothered him. And Donovan Mitchell is a dude who will throw all the blame on himself. I think that's just how he's wired. And he said, like, listen, I could have been better. I was the guy, I was not the guy everyone expected me to be or I expected to be. I let everyone down in that locker room and just for the fans in the city and everything in between, he's just like, I was careless with the basketball. My shots weren't falling. Um, he asked like, what would have been the difference? He's like, just to see my shots actually fall. And he's like, that's all it really is. And you can tell in the moment he was frustrated. Uh, but to your point, all season long, Donovan Mitchell was Superman. Maybe Jalen Brunson's his kryptonite. Who knows? But he did make it clear that this is the sixth year in a row for him where he has had a press conference after his team is eliminated in the playoffs, and that frustrates him. Um, he said he's pissed off because it's now two years in a row where he wasn't the guy for his team or he wasn't the guy his team needed him to be, and that's really frustrating to him. And, yeah, to your point, like he feel, used a lot of that frustration from how last year went with the Jazz to fuel a lot of what we saw this year for, with, from him, and the Donovan Mitchell experience has been exhilarating. Like that, that was the highlight of the season for me, for sure, is just watching Mitchell as a player and just coming to appreciate it, and we'll, we'll see how it goes, like you said. Um, I think this is a strong group, just to begin with, that is going to constantly be on each other, and I think now like they can use this as fuel to kind of push them forward, but I'm not too pressed on what Donovan Mitchell can be. I'm just more so curious to see what can the Cavs do to build around Mitchell and properly support this superstar they went and traded for because you're the Cavs. You made a move, a very splashy move to make a statement and say like, hey, we're ready to contend at the top or upper echelons of the Eastern Conference and you fall flat on your face in the first round of the playoffs. Like, sure, you made the playoffs. That's great, but. He really didn't accomplish much other than a win and four frustrating losses through this series. So we'll see how it goes. But Mitchell was pretty honest just about how he wasn't at his best. And he, you could see these frustrations were pretty, very much there. And it's just going to be... I'm curious to see how he and just the rest of the Cavs move forward from this all together. Yeah, look, if if there's something if there's something if you wanted to spin this, if I were playing spin doctor for the Cleveland Cavaliers, what I would say is that the history of the NBA tells us that teams have to go through stuff to get to somewhere deeper. This is Evan Moby's first time in the playoffs. This is Darius Garland's first time in the playoffs. Isaac Cora had never been in the playoffs before and you go down the list. Particularly young superstars in, in Mobley and Garland have never just been in this environment before. This is going to be a, a, an awakening for them. This is the first time with Mitchell in this group. He doesn't have the chemistry with those guys in, in that way that he maybe had at the at, at peaks of the Utah run, right? You would. Th this is historically if a team can take these kind of frustrating losses and get somewhere. Like look at LeBron having trouble, you know, in his first time in Cleveland. Look at Michael going back to like the bad boy Pistons and stuff like back in his day look at you know everyone kind of has to go through these lumps to get to where you want to go you have multiple losses you have disappointment against better more veteran teams we'll see what, what the what the springboards the Cavs too I, I still think there's a ton of upside with the team but they have work to do 
and it's going to be a lot. A lot of it will be on how good can these guys get, how good can these young stars get, and what do they take from this? That and and what does Mitchell take from this? What Mitchell do we see next year in his like firmly getting into his prime? I, I'm fascinated by this. It's going to be a big off season for Cleveland. We're going to cover it all here. We're going to cover everything Mitchell says. We'll cover any kind of eggs interviews or anything else that happens in that context. Cavs season is over. They lose 4-1 in the first round to the New York Knicks. Going home, I think, sooner than we expected, than anyone else expected. I want to remind you, again, that you can listen to us. Make us your first listen every thanks for that. Every day we will be back tomorrow again, starting to run through the big questions of the offseason. Let us know, maybe on Twitter or on our subtext if you want to, any question you might have. And a reminder that all of the NBA games are going to be on the Sirius XM app. Just search the NBA team you want to listen to. Check out their hometown broadcast on the Sirius XM app. I'm Chris Manning. That's Evan Demerol. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing. Back at you tomorrow with more Locked on Cavs. Enjoy the hoops. That's still going on.